Good day, everyone. Richard Copperthwaite for Northwest Access TV. Thanks for joining us. Happy to have two folks on the show who are going to have a lot of uh, good information for us. Chris Lukens, the longtime director, I guess now former director technically of Voices Against Violence and Lori's House here in St. Albans, and Shannon McMahon, the new, the new director. But nice to see you folks. Thanks for coming on. Thank you. Nice Thank to you. Here. Boy, Chris, I think we could talk for hours about uh, – <laughs> so, again, you've, you've officially – you're still helping out, but officially uh, yeah. have left the post as uh, uh, director? Yes. Um, yes, yeah, Shannon has taken over my position yeah. and doing a great Congratulations, job. Congratulations, Shannon. And Thank so you. we're in the kind of the training. Um, you know, she, she does the work. She's been doing the work for many, many years. Yeah. Um, but just um, – going over some other, other kinds of administrative things. But yes, I'm helping out. Um, it's difficult because we're so busy, and um, it just, I think it helps to have, you know, another person there to answer the phone or, yeah. um, you know, meet with people um, when needed. So I'll be just stepping down hours. Um, so next month I'll probably be just a, a, about 10 hours a week to help out in whatever I need, you know, if it's writing a grant or doing some research or yeah. something like that. So I suspect most folks have certainly know the name and have probably have mm -hmm. some handle, but for maybe folks who just don't, Voices Against Violence, Lori's House, just give us a little background. What are you guys, what's your mission? Well, our, our mission is to, you know, provide direct services to survivors and uh, provide um, education and um, systems change. Um, and so domet or domestic abuse yes, issues. And, yeah, well, basically, our big vision is to yeah. um, work towards the elimination of domestic and sexual violence. Yeah. Um, and that, you know, so that that's really where where our focus is is to to work in that direction. Any any this crossed my mind. Maybe maybe not a stupid <coughs> question. Any male? Do you occasionally have male clients? Obviously, you think of, course. of yeah. females yes. being, but you have some male. No, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. interesting. Yeah. So what? So again, you've been you've been on board for what twenty twenty eight years? Um, the, yeah, the end of this year will be twenty eight years. Wow. Um, yep. So that's a, that's long a, that's time. Incredible. <laughs> long yeah. time. Yeah. And did you was Laura, was Voices Against Violence? Uh, was it? Was that organization in place? Were you the first director? Or? Uh, no, I wasn't the first director, but we were known by a different name. We were uh, Abuse and Rape Crisis Program back okay. then. And I think when I came on board, there were only two staff. Really? Um, and uh, we were under uh, CVOEO at that time, and we still are. Um, but we were also under the Family Center, which is now not is under a different program. So we were kind of layered. Um, so our, our program was pretty small um, when we came on board. But um, so we grew it and, um, you know, just uh, did a lot of work around um, the needs in the community and um, realized that we really needed a shelter. And so we worked towards getting Lori's house. That was a big um, project and one that um, I really like growing programs and what what are the needs of the community and, and how you know our program can meet those needs so one of the big projects was developing Lori's house and when did and when did that happen when that was um well now 21 years ago oh, so really? um yeah that, and wow. at that time we also changed our name to voices against violence so it, that was a big turning point for us so did you have a background were you doing similar jobs before uh Lori's yeah. house yes i was i was um the executive director of a program in Michigan before oh. I came here oh, yeah. um, and actually started that program and um, developed a shelter and um, built that program up. Interesting. Uh, How did you end up in, in St. Albans, well, Franklin County? Um, well, we did, you know, I have family on the East Coast um, oh. at that time and wanted to be closer to family. We were looking for a change, moved my whole family here. and. Um, I thought I would probably do something different, you know. There was an opportunity to, sure. to do some different work, but um, this has been near and dear to my heart, so I kind of fell back into it. And um, there was a position open here at uh, this program, and so I applied and was hired. Interesting. Is this going to be real retirement for you? Or? <laughs> yes, it is real retirement. Yeah. Um, I just, you know, I'm just taking it in steps. Um, but yeah, it's it's time to move on. It's time for new leadership. It's time yeah. for new energy. So sure. you'd been thinking of that for a, a while, well, but it was probably over the last year. Yeah. You know, it's been kind of ongoing. Um, right. You know, I, I set a date and then I move it a little bit, but um, but yeah, I think uh, definitely. Um, you know, Shannon's been hired and she's doing a great job. Yeah. She's been with the program what five years? Yeah, five years now. So, um, and Shannon, give it. us a little background and tell us about yourself. Yeah, um, 
I was from this area. I grew up here. I grew up in Highgate. Um, and then I went to Champlain College. Um, and I started doing this work in Chittenden in Addison County. Um, so I did this work for about seven or eight years. And then there was an opening of Voices Against Violence. I was very interested to do this work in Franklin and Grand Isle, be back in my community um, and serve our, the community that I was from. So um, yeah, I joined Voices Against Violence. Interesting. So mm -hmm. a local, local person, you mm -hmm. know the local terrain yeah. pretty, pretty well. Yeah, which was definitely a benefit that I learned coming yeah. back. Um, <laughs> being from here and understanding how to navigate a lot of the community in our rural community. Um, yeah, I'm very happy to be here. It's been a great five years. Yeah. Will you hang around here, Chris, or who knows what the future brings? Yeah, or? I'll, I'll be hanging. I'm not going anywhere yeah. <laughs> for long. Hope to do some traveling and, yeah. um, you know, visiting friends and, you know, and that sort of thing. So we'll see. Your service area, obviously Franklin County. Do you pick up Grand Isle County yes. also? Yeah. So Franklin and Grand Isle? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. I assume, or maybe I shouldn't assume anything, uh, every county in the state is a whole state covered by uh, similar organizations or any um, gaps? Yes. Um, some, some programs serve whole counties plus maybe a town or two in yeah. another county. Yeah. It just, you know, just how it, it turned out, you know, how the program started. But every um, jurisdiction is, is covered by a program. There's yeah. 15 um, programs like ours in the state, yeah. um, and um, and we're all members of the Vermont Network Against Domestic and Sexual Violence. Yeah. And again, you've been under Champlain Valley Office of Economic Opportunities umbrella for since day one. The since organization. day one, yeah. yes, that's yeah, it's our history. In 1980, we started. That's um, it was a kind of a one-person hotline. Wow. Somebody saw the need, or a group a group of people saw the need and started that it was all volunteer at that point and wow. um, it just grew from there and it had m multiple names over the course of time yeah. um, but um, you know not, uh, now we're voices so and your headquarters is on Ka Catherine Street and yes. that's where the that's the shelter is right right there also or no, no the, the shelter is elsewhere um, okay. um, it you know we try to keep that as confidential as possible okay. in a small town. But, uh, but um, else, elsewhere in St. Albans? Right, elsewhere in St. Albans. Okay. Um, but we decided uh, after, or during COVID actually, that we needed separate office space, you know, to welcome people huh. that walk-ins and, and need, you know, needed service. So yeah. we, we did that, um, and um, now we're looking for bigger office space because oh, really? we've outgrown that mm -hmm. yeah. as well. So... <clears throat> COVID, boy, COVID complications, was that a, just a crazy yes. com, couple of years, I bet? Seems yeah. like for a lot of folks, for schools and... Yes, it was for us as well. I mean, for us and the people we serve, for survivors. Right. Yeah. Um, it was really difficult for people to leave, you know, during that time. Yeah. Um, oftentimes they were, you know, um, you know, we all were sheltering in place. We were all, you know, had to stay in our homes and for, you know, survivors that were experiencing... Wow. Um, abuse that would made it even more complicated and and reaching out for help made it more complicated so wow. we actually started what you know trying to think about different ways for survivors to be able to reach out and so we started our chat line um, yeah. during that time and a couple other things so that you know people who if they didn't have a phone they could still contact us and that sort of thing so we really um, and then we were all remote yeah. um, so we were doing uh -huh. a lot you know um, very differently, um, so that really changed kind of the the breadth of the work that we did. But was um, there some ben benefit? Was there some benefit that came out of that, and, and just having to deal with folks differently, or now was this just a pretty difficult thing to deal with? I think we just, you know, we just had to pivot very quickly, yeah, yeah. and um, and think about how we're going to do this, and you know, offer services in a way that that are more accessible. I mean, it taught us a lot of lessons, I think, too. Yeah. Um, and now we're back, you know, so we got we got this office space with individual offices hoping that people would, you know, once p um, people could get out again, would be able to come in and we could, you know, meet with people, um, you know, uh, in more confidential space. But, um, you know, that that has worked. Um, you know, we, we've really expanded our program because, because of that. People can drop in. They can get some donations if we have any, if they need, you know, assistance in the moment. Um, you know, we have a lot of, um, we, we do get some funding for economic supports, like that to help folks, like um, uh, gas cards or food cards, um, mm. phones, things like that. Um, although, um, 
you know, that's changing too because the money that we received during COVID is now, you know, um, getting less and less yeah. as, as we move forward. But yeah, it did kind of change the work, I think, yeah. and we really had to think about how we're going to approach it differently and be able to reach out to folks. And did the numbers go down a lot? Were you getting just fewer, fewer calls with, with people not able to get out of their house or did that, did that change the numbers or? Yeah, at first, all the hotlines in the state were silent. We weren't hearing from anyone. Really? So all agencies in the state really had to regroup, like Chris mentioned, yeah. and just figure out how we're gonna serve folks when they are, when their partners that may be causing them harm are with them so much more mm -hmm. in their homes. And the wow. intersection with mental health and substance use yes. got really hard. So we're really still seeing the impacts of that yeah. in the communities that we serve. Um, and we had to do a lot of work with helping our the advocacy staff feel supported and be able to take time for themselves. They were working from home. It was really hard to navigate how much they were working. It seemed like our whole staff was working 24 hours for a while, mm -hmm. which um, is not sustainable. So. We had we learned a lot of lessons um, yes, around how to serve staff and Chris and I talk all the time the work does not look the same and we don't know if it ever will go back to looking the same yeah. Yeah. Um, we spent a lot of time trying to get back to that base but we realized that might not serve the communities and our staff the way that it did before so mm -hmm. constantly trying to rethink and a lot of this work is reevaluating is what we're doing working um, what could we be do, doing better and, and talking staff, tell them how, how big, how much staff do you have? How big is, is the staff? Um, we have, uh, I think, 12 staff. Oh. Um, that includes everyone. We have two people that do after hours hotline for oh. us, so we count them as, our, as part of our staff. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, but they're not full time. Um, and the rest of us are uh, full time. Really? We have. Um, wow six, seven, eight advocates uh, yep. uh, at Voices, and then we also have a program called All About Kids, which is a supervised visitation right. program, yeah. and that's in a different location, and they provide supervised visitation for, uh, for families that, um, in which case, you know, um, it's not safe for one, you know, one person yeah. to, you know, without supervision I'm to, sure to visit with their kids. I'm familiar with them in, yeah. in my past. In the past mm -hmm. 10 years, I've done yeah. some court supervision cases uh, where That's right. I remember kids, that, uh, yes. Have done, yes. Have done sounds like all about kids. Yeah. Uh, obviously, that's, a, that's their, their existence. Yes. And we, mm -hmm. you know, that they are going strong. You know, we've, uh, funding has been up and down with that program, but yeah. it, I think it, it's a great value to the, to the community. So, um, you know, we've really... Uh, tried to keep that going, and um, they do see a lot. Mostly, I think, are court-ordered um, yeah. families, um, but they also work uh, with DCF, Department of Children and Families. Right. Um, and then they get, you know, referrals from people on their own as well. So, But uh, that's two people there, so um, a, a coordinator and a, and a monitor. So, Boy, speaking of DCF, staff. Department of Children and Families, <laughs> Uh, there have been recent stories just uh, changing maybe some of their procedures, but yeah. they seem to run into a lot of uh, crit criticism. Is that, what are your thoughts on DCF? Was that <laughs> the contrary? That's probably something you could talk about for a long time or maybe you don't want to talk about. But <laughs> how, how have you fared with DCF for you folks anyway? Well, I, you know, I, we've seen a lot of changes in DCF yeah. over the years. and. Um, I think um, you know, kind of goes up and down depending on you know some of the you know situations that that happen in the state. Yeah. Um, I you know, yet yeah, we work with a lot of people that have DCF involvement, and in fact, one of our our children's um, services coordinator, family services coordinator, part of her time is dedicated to working with DCF um, on the you know working with families that are, are connected with DCF and helping them maneuver that system. It's a system that can be very difficult and yeah. complicated uh, mm -hmm. for families. Mm -hmm. And um, there's a lot of a lot of their families, there's domestic violence involved in, in their families. So kind of maneuvering through and working with a, a huge system, you know, to, um, you know, work with, you know, keeping their kids safe and keeping themselves safe. Um, so it's, um, but we do, do do a lot of work um, with them for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So Chris, again, when you started, I forget, was there two two staff members or almost solo when you Pretty started? Pretty much. <laughs> I really? think we had two staff people and then we had like an intern. Wow. Um, and yeah, so we, we grew from there um, as, as funding became available. Yeah. Um, and you know, a, a good part of my time was you know writing some grants. And then in 19, I think 97, when the Violence Against Women Act was passed in Congress, 
that opened up a whole different pot of money for programs such what, as ours. What act was that? Pardon me? What, 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 what happened in Congress? Uh, it was the Violence Against Women oh, Act Against that, Women was, Act. that yeah. was developed oh, wow. and signed on. Huh. Um, it was pretty. It was a popular one, you know, uh, on both parties um, back then. Interesting. So it was really it. It, it created boundaries. It created some uh, structure yeah. for the yeah. work, but it also created some funding um, that we never had access to before. Wow. Um, and um, so there's multiple programs now. I can't even tell you how many programs under that really? um, that funding, but um, we were able to access. Some of that funding, and, wow. and currently we have four grants mm -hmm. um, through the Violence Against Women um, Act, and uh, that has that enabled us to really expand mm -hmm. our work. Mm -hmm. um, we do, uh, one um, one is in partnership with the city, and we work with um, the local St. Albans Police Department, and now we're expanding that work uh, to other police departments. Um, but it's about um, focusing on risk um, that you know when police uh, go to the scene. Of a domestic violence, and they can, you know, work with the, the survivor and assessing risk, and if they, um, and then they can make that referral to us to follow up and you know provide services to okay. to that family. Um, another one is about transitional housing. So we do have um, five transitional apartments. Oh. Um, so that's the next step after emergency shelter. Yeah. Um, that they can stay in those up to two years. Up to up to two years. Yeah, and we provide services along the way to help them. Uh, how, how many how many folks how many beds how many folks can um, you? We have well five apartments. Um, I think a combination of different um, sizes. Yeah. So we have you know singles. Um, we have um, I think we have a three bedroom apartment. We have a two I think two two bedroom apartments. Yep. Wow. Um, and. We're hoping to expand that a little bit with some other funding that CVOEO received. Wow. Um, so we're looking forward to expanding that program and having more transitional housing apartments, which really can help people stabilize. You know, I mean, after the emergency shelter, that they, they they can um, you know have a place of their own, and, and that's um, up for two years. Yeah. They can yeah, they can stay. Yeah. Wow. yeah, yeah, yeah. And how, how many how many folks can you deal with at the temporary shelter at the shelter? A good amount. We have yeah. four room. We have five rooms. We have one really big family room. Huh. Then we have another room that's pretty big, three beds. It could be a family or a couple single folks. Yeah. Then we have two other good size rooms on the other side of the of the house. Um, they both have two beds. We can have a, two, a couple singles or a family. During COVID, everybody had their own room. We tried to separate as much as we can, right. but now we're getting back into having more folks at the space. Um, Lori's house is very lovely. It has hmm. a dining room, a kids room. We have a backyard that has a garden, a playground. Wow. We just got some seating last wow. year with a grant that we had to get more like holistic space for outside. We have three staff members there, um, and we allow pets too because pets is a big piece of people wow. fleeing. Um, in our experience, folks will are very worried about their pets when they flee. Their pets may experience violence as well. There's a lot of mm -hmm. threats of violence with high risk, like a lot of threats against <coughs> pets with high risk violence. So folks can have pets at shelter. Um, mm. A lot of times folks will deny housing and sleep in their car if their pet can't come. So we yeah. just really want to be right. accessible to that piece. We also work with folks um, around their children, ways to help build parenting back up. Um, we see children that have to build up respect with the survivor, the parent that primarily experienced harm and a lot of ways to build connection um, and repair any relationships. We have a grant called Healing Together that does a lot of that work with survivors, especially in the intersections of like mental health, substance use, incarceration, mm -hmm. all of these really nuanced pieces that really affect someone's experience with violence. Mm -hmm. um, so we do, a, we do a lot of great work at Lori's house. Um, we're very proud of the work that we do there. And, and how long can folks stay? Can people stay at Lori's house for? Well, that's Zero. so, it looks so different than it used to. When I started doing this work, the stays yeah. were like maybe a couple days. Maybe yeah. someone just needed a night. Like yeah. they were at the hospital right. and they just need like some kind of respite for the night. Yeah. Um, the stays ideally were like three months before, but now they're so, there's the, the lengths are so much longer because of the need, especially the more vulnerable a survivor is. Like yeah. if it's someone that experiences like physical disability, like a single person that may, um, be a little bit older or um, like any intersection of vulnerability, it's harder for someone to have safe and stable housing. 
Um, also, just the housing has gotten so much more expensive here. Mm-hmm. Even when I moved back here, it was pretty staggering how much more expensive it is in Franklin Grand Isle and even just Vermont. So, Sounds like yeah. it's a you know, huge, huge issue. I mean, yeah. you keep and the stories of about yeah. people right. who yeah. want to come to Vermont and work and just yeah. can't find a place right. to live. Right. Oh, and yeah, a lot of folks issue. flee to Vermont, too. Yeah. 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 yeah, there's just the lack of housing mm-hmm. um, and, um, and then the cost of that housing. And the lack of, you know, um, subsidized housing and that sort of thing. And, yeah. and, you know, people's incomes haven't risen as much as housing yeah. prices have. It's sure. like St. Albans is uh, trying to do its year. Obviously, the big project going up down on yes. Lake yeah, Street. Yes, that's great. And that, that some is other great. projects yeah, in, in the great. works and stuff. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And we're trying to, to figure out something, like Chris said, with transitional housing and having a more holistic office space that yeah. Yeah. meets more of the needs. Um, yeah, there's such a need for longer-term yeah. housing. Your rapport with St. Albans Police Department is that uh, is that decent? You you feel you have yeah yeah. yeah. Shannon can you know Shannon's doing a lot of work in that area. Yeah, we love working with our police partners. Um, We do a lot of great work with the police. Chris mentioned our risk assessment, the lethality assessment protocol. It really helps assess risk, like Chris mentioned, and then build those informal relationships with police officers. So we do a lot of work with police, um, and. Uh, definitely St. Albans Police Department they're so helpful in so many ways that we do like a lot of out of the box work um, because of our relationship we can call and they can they can help us in some pretty hard situations or do some things that may not be in their role but because of our relationship they are very helpful Um, so they're pretty pivotal piece of the work that we do most survivors that we work with will never access the criminal justice system because there's so many barriers to what like accountability and justice mm-hmm. really looks like. And really. Um, so we're trying to find other ways. Chris has done a lot of work with restorative justice. She's on the restorative justice board, um, trying to figure out more transformative ways for survivors to find accountability, justice. And like a lot of our work is asking survivors, what does healing look like for you? And how, mm-hmm. like, how can our programming meet that need for you? Hmm. Everybody's idea of healing is so different, even children, yeah. youth, adults. So. Um, it's definitely not a one-size-fits-all, so we try to do a lot of work with the criminal justice system, but also <coughs> every other system, and a lot of work with our community. We just want survivors to have as many options as possible. Everyone's so different. Right. Right. Do you keep do you keep track of the, the, the many people you've dealt with, hundreds, uh, maybe thousands, whatever, do you keep track of how they fare when when they're no longer getting your services? Uh, you, you know, do you mm-hmm. keep track of them some, somehow, or...? sure you're interested in how they're doing but oh, yeah, for right sure. right yeah. It, it's you know it's up it's to them sometimes you know they'll send us a little card in the mail or yeah. mm-hmm. um or we'll see them a couple years later or we get a phone call saying thank you you know you really helped me um so it's really up to them mm-hmm. uh, we don't it's very difficult we don't really have a great sure. system in place to do follow-up you know yeah. long-term follow-up takes a lot of effort sure. and, you know staff time but um you know so uh, it's really up, you know, if somebody wants to come to us for services again or or just to check in or whatever, you know, yeah. it's it's, um, it, it's something that, that that they can do themselves. And we love hearing from people and, and, and you know, seeing how they're doing. Right. For sure. do, I mean, do you know the, 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 the folks you're dealing with who have been victims, do, do most of them hopefully uh, move on and have a better life after that? Or, I mean, do you know any percentage of that? I can only assume... X percentage get back into difficult situations again, but those aren't. You have any any feel for that? Uh, I think tough tough question. <laughs> oh no, I think yeah. there's a lot of ways that our programming helps people find safety and stability. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think when it comes to, like we mentioned, how expensive it is here, and yeah. when people there are just some survivors of violence that have more barriers. Yeah. and they experience violence more repeatedly and chronically. Yeah. A lot of it does also have to do with like child adverse effects like how their experience as a child was um it creates yeah um so we do work with a lot of folks that were able to find stability and safety and it was it was very great to work with them and we may not hear from them again or like chris said we might get a card or when we see them in the community they might be really thankful we also work with a lot of folks that come back to our services. I was going to say, obviously, you get some people who come back, obviously. Yeah, Yeah. and we're so voluntary, and it may just be someone that, like, we helped, and then they know somebody, so they're, like, coming with that person, like, Mm -hmm. like, Voices Against Violence helped me in these ways. This is my friend. I want you to talk about all the ways you can help them. And then there's also just folks that 
it's really hard to flee in Vermont in Franklin County. So we have folks that will have tried to flee and they weren't able to because mm -hmm. of the barriers. There's a lot of barriers to accessing safety, especially if you have children. Like mm -hmm. transportation's an issue. You want to keep them in the same school district. Yeah. You want to keep their lives as normal as possible. Um, so we work. We we try to make our services really open. We want folks to feel like if they ever need to call us again, they're able to. Um, we sometimes we answer the hotline and they're like. I'm so sorry, I have to call again. And we don't want them to feel that way. We want folks to feel like they're welcome anytime because yeah. we understand that this violence, especially domestic violence, can be repetitive. Um, when somebody tries to leave, their risk is actually the highest for experiencing lethality. Wow. Um, so mm -hmm. we just want to honor every part of someone's experience. So. We and, do, yeah. and unfortunately, we can't always accommodate if somebody does want to leave. We can't always accommodate them because our ha our housing is so limited. Yeah. Our shelter is always full. <coughs> is that right? Um, I meant to ask you that. Yeah. Al always, always full. full. And, really. um, you know, and what do you do with the folks who you don't have room for? What are, but we do have funding to um, <coughs> put help people stay in hotels, yeah. local hotels. Um, but that funding um, is limited, and um, so and that that's not always available because we're competing with. Um, economic services, you know, for, for other types of homelessness. Yeah. Um, well, makes me so think there's a lot of people unhoused and, and, you know, there's just not enough housing. So, um, yeah. you know, we just um, will continue to work with people, certainly. Um, but actually leaving and fleeing is very difficult if you don't have a place to go. Wow. Of course, the homeless issue, the in their shoes, we're yes. kind of focusing, Absolutely. of course, on. Absolutely. It's a huge issue, well, not just for us, but, no, sure. you know. Huge that, issue for the state, yeah. for the legislature and exactly. the governor. To seem to struggling yeah. with it. Yeah. struggle, I guess, yes. is, a, is the best word yeah. for that. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And I'm, obviously, we have X number of homeless folks in the St. Albans area. Are yes. those some of the yes. folks? Yes. Do you deal there? Some encampments, right? Yeah. yeah. Right yeah. here. Do you deal with some of those those folks? Do they? Yeah. I yeah. mean, there's so many ways that folks that are unhoused living in encampments are so vulnerable to yes. experiencing violence. Yes. Even if they left a situation that was wow. violent, now they're vulnerable. They have to find a place that's secure for them to sleep. Yeah. Um, they have to assess their safety 24 hours a day. Exactly. It's exhausting. Um, so we help folks. They can come to our office. Like Chris mentioned, we have donations for toiletries. We yeah. like if there's like some food that we can share. We try to have like snacks, prepared food available. Um, we have a bathroom. <clears throat> we have like um, hygiene projects. So we just help folks get by day to day. Um, so we'll some, of, some of these folks will will stop by. And oh yeah, absolutely. And, and we um, encourage that. That's really you know I think the whole point of us having a uh, open um, office yeah. um, instead of just the shelter where our, where our staff was before. But, yeah. you know, we do get lots of donations and, and like blankets and things wow. like that. You know, if somebody needs a blanket because they're sleeping outside yeah. um, or, or shoes yeah. or, wow. you know, um, just a, a multitude of, of different. The, the community has been wonderful in donating yeah. you know, to us. Yes, for sure. You certainly have a, g a good feeling. Franklin, the situation here in Franklin, Grand Isle County, northwestern Vermont, just in terms of domestic abuse is, uh, I'm sure you have a feel for the rest of the state. Is the situation up here much different than elsewhere in the, in the state, or is that a hard question to? Well, I th in my experience, you know, we're all experiencing all the programs. Yeah. I mean, we, we we talk. I mean, the 15 programs get okay. together. We, we talk you get, about you some get, of the You get together once in a while? Yes. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. As a, um, we, I used to be on the board at the Vermont Network, um, huh. so we would have those meetings. But we also had, before COVID, we would meet every other month um, huh. in person. Yeah. And, you know, we had agenda items and so forth. But um, but it would also gave us an opportunity to, just to, to talk with each other, you know, talk right. with other directors yeah. and find out, you know, hey, this happened to us, you know, did it happen to you? How did you handle it? You know, and just, you know, those kinds of things. No, it sounds um, like a, a good, smart yeah. thing to do, yeah. of course. Yeah. And then, you know, COVID happened and we started meeting online uh, virtually and right. every week, actually, because we, we were all struggling, you know, it's like how we're going to, you know, manage you wow. know these things that that are happening during covid yeah. and um and that sort of thing so and now we're starting to meet back in person again which is really great mm. and it's just um it, it's just good to be with other people that are doing the work and you know saying i you know i've experienced this you know is that happening down in bennington or or whatever and yeah. you know how do you handle it that that sort of thing so it's a very um i think uh, very supportive group 
of people. Yeah. So mm -hmm. throughout the state, the, the services that other organizations offer, are they typically similar to yours? or? Um, I think, I think you know, pretty much, yes. There's, yeah. there's as, as a member of the, uh, the Vermont Network, there's standards. So we have to, you know, abide by the, the standards, which are basic, yeah. like running a 24-hour hotline and, you know, providing certain services and that sort of thing. So we all do that. But then also programs do other things, too, that maybe they, um, uh, you know, want to move in a different direction or provide a, a service. One of the things that we did, were able to do, this happened during COVID, is that um, we were asked by the Vermont Network if we wanted to uh, participate in a new grant um, project called Healing Together. And Shannon mm -hmm. talked about the healing work we do. Mm -hmm. That was pivotal. That oh, was, was just mm -hmm. amazing how yes. it changed our work. Yeah. And so there's two of us, two programs that are involved in that, in that grant. And so that's something that we were able to take on and, um, and do and grow. And now we're reapplying. Hopefully we'll get continued funding. That has just actually just immensely changed the scope of our work and what we can offer. Wow. Yeah. Um, and, you know, maybe Shannon can talk a little bit more about that that project. Oh, yeah. Um, and what Chris mentioned before with the Office of Violence Against Women, the funding that we were finally able to get, it's all wrapped up in crisis, like yeah. hmm. navigating yes. crisis when it happens. There's not a lot of funding for prevention, like yes. working really? with youth yep. and children well, in our think, communities. You think, you think, yeah. Yeah. It's That's hard to find funding for prevention work. It's, it's, it's hard to prove. It's like, yeah. you know, what, what does your you know, prevention efforts do? Yeah. You know, and how right. is that going to help? It's way in the future. We're right. not going to see results right away. And we're trying to figure that out, too. We're working with, um, like, Pam McCarthy's on our advisory council. Yeah. She has a lot of experience with working with families. Yeah. We're trying to figure out ways to create our own data, measure success. Um, but, yeah, historically, that work is not funded. We have to do it on our own when we can when we have any capacity that's not navigating crisis. So there's not a lot of work around stabilization or just healing. Huh. We know in our rural community there's so much generational violence yeah. and harm. Yeah. Um, really? we, yeah. we all experience, like there's a lot of cr chronic domestic and sexual violence people experience as children, youth, and adults. And this Healing Together work, it helps survivors that are adults that have all of these, all of these experiences with violence and all this trauma held in their bodies. We help them work with their children, find healing. Um, how, how are the, how are how are the ways that we've all survived violence affected our parenting? Like, mm -hmm. how how can we have conversations about that and support our children to break that cycle of violence? There's a lot of wonderful activities with healing together. Yes. Um, one is the Lullaby Project, which is mm -hmm. Scrag Mountain Very Music good. and Writers in Recovery. They come to our All About Kids space because it's a nice space, and we have survivors. Um, they actually create lullabies for a loved one. It's usually their children, but it can be any loved one. A survivor wrote one about themselves. Um, an advocate in our last round wrote one about working with survivors. Um, but it's just a really great space to heal like, and really dive into their experience with their children and say things to their children that they want to about how much they love them. And mm -hmm. it was a really, it was a really inc incredible last round. Um, every survivor that we worked with was a mom. They wrote for their children, but they all also experienced having their rights terminated because of violence that they've experienced. Mm -hmm. Like with Chris mentioned, DCF is a big system, and there's so many intricacies of experience violence in our rural areas that um, we have some of the highest rates of children in custody, Franklin County does, and we have mm -hmm. since I started working here. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So there's a lot of heartbreak that comes with that. Yeah. Women do, yeah. or survivors do so much to keep their children safe, um, but it's not black and white. Like, there's a lot of gray area, um, and there's a lot of ways that systems can harm. Um, there's a lot of ways that systems can wrap around families, but the work is just so intricate. We have a lot of work to do with serving people in these intersections, but they, they were able to write lullabies to their children, um, and it was, it was yeah. really incredible. Um, it's amazing. It was definitely, you could definitely feel like there was healing. And then they were also able to connect with each other. They gave each other their phone numbers. Um, yeah. Building community is such a big piece in ending yeah. violence. Um, our rural area, isolation breeds violence. Yeah. Somebody might have their partner move to an area in Franklin County mm -hmm. that's much more rural, that just their family has, like, just that the person that's primarily causing them harm, their family lives there. We'll have survivors call us and be like, I don't have any connection to this community. I'm so alone. I don't have a car. 
Mm -hmm. Um, I don't have daycare for my children, so we don't have any of these components of community. And we just see the ways that isolation breeds violence and Mm -hmm. community enables healing. So we try to do a lot of work with community, listening to survivors, um, doing focus groups, doing support groups, trying any way we can to build community. Um, Mm -hmm. It's such a big piece, especially with that intersection of substance dependency, how we're seeing people coerced by substances, controlled by substances. There's a big intersection with trafficking here because of our geographic area. Mm -hmm. So um, we do a lot of work with trafficking that might look a little bit different than all the network programs because of how much we have to dive into it here because of the need, um, which can look really intricate. Um, so close to the border. Which, yeah. wow. you know, has, that become, to that. has that become a bigger problem? And is that... I, I, over the, yeah, over the last you know, number of years, yeah. we've just seen that increase. It's not something <coughs> well, that we really we, we saw or yeah. dealt with um, yeah. many, many years ago, but now um, the work is just you know, changing. Yeah. Sure. You mentioned transportation, and I'm sure a lot of the survivors mm-hmm. yeah, don't have tra- transportation yeah. difficulties. Can you help? That sounds like that just makes their situation mm-hmm. tougher and your mm-hmm. situation tougher, obviously. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, servicing them. It's such a big piece. And is that, is that, is that the case with a lot of these folks who oh, don't? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I yeah. mean, if you're, you know, not in St. Albans City, right. per se, yeah. uh, there wow. is, you know, I mean, yes, there's a bus that goes to Richford one once a day that's still and that bus is still yeah. there so yeah it's very but limited it's, then they're stuck in the you know what in the city yeah. all day you know if they have to come in for something it's just because all the services are centered here as well yeah uh, which makes it difficult um, wow. so transportation is huge wow. we um you know we do we help people you know we spend an absorbent amount of money oh, on yes. taxis there, and there and are some taxis like that. Around, yeah right? there are yeah, some taxis yeah. but uh, oftentimes they they don't, you know, run uh, late at night and right. those kind of, kinds of things. So, wow. it, you know, we're constantly trying to find ways to, you know, um, deal with those kinds of things. And it's not just us. You know, there's really a consortium of, of programs that see that, you know, transportation is a huge issue in our area and how can we build capacity to, you know, provide that for folks. Yeah. Well, that yeah. sounds like you have these issues just sound yeah. almost overwhelming to <laughs> just this outside uh, observer but Mm -hmm. uh it is a lot um one thing that we do with our work is acknowledging the injustice like acknowledging with survivors that we do have limitations because this violence is just so overarching it's been compounded since our society has started there's a lot of work to do and we're only 10 people in two counties so but we do work very hard we do try to go to like chris mentioned there's all of our services are here, so folks try to come here. But there's a lot in those rural areas. There's like libraries. Um, there's any ways that um, folks can access in the towns that they live in. We try to go to them. Mm-hmm. So if somebody yeah. calls our hotline and they need to meet with an advocate, we'll tr- we'll we'll <coughs> go to where they are. Um, we'll try to meet them in a public location. Um, so we try to build our relationships with our more rural towns to try to find where can we meet with survivors. Mm-hmm. Where can we um, do this crisis work um what can we build off of in the areas that they're in um we try to do support groups if we see a need like richford we there were a lot of folks that want to do like an art support group so we yeah. started one up there hmm. and then we reassess the needs so we do have a small staff but we try very hard to be out on the outskirts of st albans because we see so much of the need there mm-hmm. have you got any have you got any physical presence in grand isle county or um yes we do um you know we uh, they have a courthouse there, so we definitely go there. When um, we one of the the services we provide is is helping people, um, you know, with the criminal justice system or and the civil justice system. So yeah. mm-hmm. if they want to, for instance, <coughs> file a restraining order, um, we can help them fill out the paperwork. Hmm. Uh, they can also do it after hours, and we let them know how to how to do that. Um, and then we're able to go to court with them for the final hearings. Hmm. Um, so we do that in Grand Isle and we do that um, here um, of course during COVID they started doing it virtually right. so now um, it, it could be in person or virtually so um, right. which gives um, survivors an option so they don't have to face the, the person that that you know caused them harm face to face they can do that you know um, virtually so that's been helpful um, but yes we do we do that in Grand Isle we'll go over to Grand Isle to meet with people if need be. Most of the services are centered in St. Albans. Sure. Um, um, 
but we, we absolutely will go to people um, wherever they need us to go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we do a lot of work in the schools School, as well. Yeah. So that, that, was on my, yeah. that was on my mm -hmm. list. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, we do a lot of work with um, like younger, younger, like children's ages up to high school. And we do a lot of work with like building consent, empathy, and boundaries. So talking with young folks, like young children, about what consent looks like with boundaries at a, like a very simplistic way, talking about like who's a safe person that you can access. Um, mm. Like usually a lot of folks in our society say like a safe person is your mom, your dad, your aunt, or your uncle. But what we know about the ways that children experience violence is mm. they experience violence in their homes. It's not typically from a stranger. It can be, but the prime... Primarily, children will experience violence from a loved one or someone that has a built-up relationship with them. So we can't really be naming who is safe to them. We have to have them identify for themselves who is safe. So we do a lot of that work with young children. And then up to high school, having more consistent conversations about healthy romantic relationships and just consent, like mm -hmm. consent with intimacy um, and all the other ways consent plays into your lives and what like expectations are in relationships. Um, expectations as being like a woman identified person all the ways that masculinity and power play into violence mm -hmm. like um like we mentioned when we first started talking we serve men we serve everybody on the gender spectrum because everybody's touched by gendered violence yeah. so we're really talking to um high school folks we do a lot of work with spectrum um trying to really build that consent culture as yeah. much as we can we do not have the funding to do it we're working on that right now mm -hmm. we have some really invested folks in our community we're trying to talk with more um but really trying to build that work as much as we can our educator has been doing this work for a decade um and she's been building some really great connections in the schools especially bfa st Albans. so we're mm -hmm. really excited to build that work yeah. Yeah. of course vermont's court system of course the COVID situation seven days that of course the cover story what a week or two ago on mm with trials and tribulations, but yes. um, do you feel, do you feel like you feel okay with the court? Has that gotten easier, more difficult to deal with or any thoughts on the court system, Chris or Shannon? Um, I think, you know, I know that they're backlogged, um, yeah. you yeah. know, because of COVID and, and that has caused, um, you know, some concerns in our community and uh, throughout the state. Um, I think it's just going to take time for them to, to work through that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but you know the, the majority of the people that we work with and probably service to aren't involved with the criminal justice system. So um, it, you know it's a smaller percentage that we do that we work with. But yeah. we have really good relationships. We have a <clears throat> one of our another of our OVW grants, Office of Violence Against Women grants, um, is working with the court system and uh, providing um, uh, and working with legal aid to help folks that need legal advice. Hmm. We have um, legal clinics twice a month. Um, that people can sign up for just to get some advice. Yeah. Um, and um, then she can also provide representation in court if need be. Um, and we do um, uh, you know, go to court with, with folks. Um, so we do have you know, a lot of um, projects centered uh, with the criminal justice system and, and the police um, through our, you know, our connections and our funding through the Violence Against Women Act. Yeah. But um, we do have... Um, I think we have really good relationships, um, as, as Shannon yeah. mentioned, yeah. especially with St. Albans Police Department. Now they're going to be taking over the town. Um, so right, big, big news. Yeah, July 1st, uh, yes. CDPD is yeah. back in St. Albans yeah. town. Right, mm -hmm. right. So I think, I mean, they were the first ones that said, yes, we'll step up and, and yeah. do this uh, risk assessment project um, with you. So we're, we're you know, So has that relationship that. gotten better over the years? Yeah. Um, definitely. Yeah, for sure. Definitely. Oh, yeah. yeah. I feel like they're very supportive mm -hmm. and we're also we expanded the lethality assessment to swanton police yeah. huh. and state police um they help swanton with their capacity and then mm. we recently when i got back from attorney leave recently we we're expanding to the sheriff's department i was so. about to ask you about the yep. sheriff's department yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah so they have 30 officers under like under that, that department so yeah. we're excited to to be able to do that work we see a lot of just like they put out the work that they do um, on their website. So we just see a lot of like aggregate domestics they've been working with. So yeah. 
-hmm. it's a great way to intersect and, and collaborate. Yeah, yeah mm -hmm. I hope it's in law enforcement, and I talked to the sheriff once in a while, but of course, San Alban City PD taking over in the town July yep. 1st, but at that point, Sheriff's Department will take over in Highgate, which yes. City PD yep. has been yeah. dealing with, but right. hopefully right. this will free up the Sheriff's Department to pick up contracts with some of the other towns in the county that I think would like some law yes. enforcement. Yes. They're so. going to be doing Richford too, um, yeah. Enosburg, Good. like more of the outskirts of yeah. those populations yeah. that that are, there's pockets of really vulnerable populations in those areas. So we're yeah. we're really looking forward to collaborating with the yeah. sheriff's department yeah. around those communities. And that yeah. you know they are really w used to working in the rural area, so I yeah. think that would be really helpful. Well, yeah. well Chris, looking looking back 20, 28 years. <laughs> Has just the situation you're dealing with it, has it changed? I mean, oh, greatly. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's a, the work it's has such a for sure. such, I yeah. realize the work is it's such a broad yeah. question. Just with domestic abuse, is that is that is that situation just as bad now as it was then, or anything? Well, any, I think yeah, you know, it come still exists. Mind? Obviously, it uh, I think it still it just, you know, the work has changed, and you know, you know, as, as Shannon mentioned with trafficking, that's not something we dealt with years right. ago. Wow. Now we're seeing more of that, um, so wow. it definitely has changed and evolved, um, and so have our services to meet that need. Right. Um, but yeah, when I first started, you know, forty-five years ago doing this wow. work. Um, it was a matter of just trying to get people safe, yeah. and I took people home yeah. <laughs> with me, you know, wow. and um, and wow. we, but we didn't have long, you know, other services. It was really centered around getting people out of, you know, a, a domestic situation and into safety. Um, huh. But you know, that was kind of, you know, we had very limited services. Sure. Um, and as we've, you know, learned more about this work and how it's evolved, you know, we've added services that you know we saw were needed. Like this healing together project yeah. has been, I think, um, you know, has really changed how we do our work, yeah. and um, uh, and so we're meeting, you know, developing services or changing services to meet the needs. So it's it's definitely evolved from when I first started. Uh, for sure. That sounds like I see yeah. evolved big yeah. time. Yeah. yeah. Have you got a rough percentage for me? Just number of um, people, mostly women, but number of people who run into domestic abuse. Is there a you know, I'm just a, well, stat, a stat guy out of yeah. curiosity. <laughs> Maybe almost afraid to know this if I, you have an answer. I think, I mean, there's national statistics. I think yeah, it's I'm like sure. one in six. Yeah. No. So about 20, or, you said 26, one? No, no. I, well, that might be sexual assault. Um, I, it's, wow. it's hard. We, we, we serve probably about um, 500 to 550 people oh, a year. I should have asked you that. Is that, um, is that in our program? 500 plus? Yeah. 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 Wow. That's unduplicated in a year, yeah. but wow. you know sometimes we you know there will be duplications over over years. Yeah. But um, and that you know that could be just from a hotline call you know yeah. asking you know just you know needing services for one time yeah. or somebody we're working with for a lot of times you sure. know or helping them in the court or helping them with DCF or or, or what have you. Yeah. Um, or we've been housing them. Wow. So um, it, it varies. The level of service yeah. varies for sure, but um, but still yeah, a, a huge consistent. a huge issue, yeah. a huge problem. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. We, Not yeah. just in Vermont, oh, but sure. everywhere. Sure. But with yeah. the work that we do and how we work with our communities every day, our advocacy staff recognizes that most people that live in Franklin Grand Isle could access our services mm -hmm. at some point. Yeah. That's how overarching and prevalent yeah. domestic and sexual violence is, and gender yeah. violence, like gender harassment, um, yeah. just like somebody's perceived sexual orientation or gender can cause them harm like they can experience violence mm -hmm. because of that so we serve we try to serve as many folks touched by gendered violence as we can which also includes like racial equity yes. um, mm -hmm. we know that yeah. different identities are more likely to experiencing violence and the ways that racial harm intersects with gendered harm so we try to really educate our communities and support our staff to serve survivors in an equitable way so mm -hmm. We talk a lot about how we don't serve everybody the same because everybody's needs aren't the same and everybody identifies needing different things. Mm -hmm. And that has a lot to do with their experience as a person. So mm -hmm. we tr equity is a big piece of the work that we do, which yeah. wasn't always how it was right. um, just because the way the work has evolved, the way that yeah. humanity has evolved. Yeah. 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 So even in your Absolutely. five years, just according to evolution, just oh, yeah. as you. Uh, yeah. yeah. It's not something we used to talk about or, yeah. or, or didn't felt like it wasn't part of the yeah. work that we do, but you know, yeah. it is, it yeah. absolutely is part of the work that we do. Wow, yeah. you mentioned gender. I was struck by the pride celebration, which mm -hmm. I 
caught some of them. Took, we were in the parade. Of, we were in the parade. parade. <laughs> I, mean, I just, I just <laughs> missed the parade. Afterwards. But was I was great. impressed. I hadn't yeah. thought too much about it, but that was certainly a way bigger yes. event than I thought it was going yes. to be, and it sounded like it went over very yeah. well. Well, yeah, Pride Corps, they're uh, a new, they're doing great. new yeah. nonprofit, two people, incredible amount of work, a lot yeah. of mutual wow. aid work. Mm -hmm. We're very excited to keep working with them. Yeah, we know that folks that identify as transgender are much more likely to experience Absolutely. violence. Um, right. 2016 was the deadliest year for transgender folks. Mm -hmm. um, just the, the rigid gender binaries that we feel like we all have to abide by yeah. have a lot of room to cause violence. So yeah. the more yeah. accepting we can be of everybody um, and less rigid of, mm -hmm. so, of expectations of people, that's definitely going to help end violence in Franklin yeah. Grand Isles. So we try. That. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. We, we definitely try. Um, Especially our work with children in shelter, like, um, especially like, like little kids of color, like little girls of color, they'll yeah. like come back from school and they might feel like mm. they have to have like a more of a, like a, a European idea of beauty. Huh. So we we try to really like hold up children um, mm -hmm. to celebrate themselves. Celebration's a really big piece of yeah. ending violence. So like the Pride yeah. celebration, the Juneteenth celebration that's going to be this yeah, Wednesday, Juneteenth and we'll be in, yeah. We'll be in fact, part I, of that I in should the park. now that yeah. you know, yeah. I should know we're taping this show on. Or are we Thursday, June thirteenth? So, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, Juneteenth coming yeah. up. Is that, yeah. is that an official state holiday? Yes, it yeah. is. It is. Yes. Is it a federal? Is it a federal holiday? I don't think. Well, don't I think guess it not is. Federal, but, but it's a state holiday. Um, I believe yeah. it's a state holiday. At, well, at least we. Yeah. <laughs> with CBO, it, it is yeah, a holiday. Yeah, no, I think it, I think um, it is a yeah, state holiday. State Banks holiday. are typically yeah. closed yeah. and yeah. stuff. Yeah. So I think. Uh, yeah, yeah and we'll be in the park on yeah. Wednesday, um, and and enjoying that celebration and. And uh, we'll have we'll be tabling, so we'll have lots of information for folks, which is something mm -hmm. we do a lot. Is is um, uh, join celebrations or join you know when you know areas like uh, National Night Out, which is right. uh, working with law enforcement. So yeah. we'll we'll be there both in Swanton and St. Albans. Oh, that's always a fun yeah, night. Yeah, that is yeah, fun. That's yeah. a good yeah. a great night. <laughs> so it's a way to get our information out there. Get um, you know we have brochures. We can. Have, conversations people want to know what we do and this is how, or how they can help yeah. we're looking for volunteers um, to help with our work um, and so it, it's it's a great community outreach and you know building community as, as Shannon has mentioned yeah um, it's a way to do that yeah as well. no, just trying to get the word out yep. I mean obviously yep. as as long as you've been around here X number of people still probably are not, you know, not everybody's aware of services and oh, yeah. stuff. Oh, they still Obviously. say that. I didn't know you existed, you know. Yeah, but you yeah. still, you yeah. still hear that. Yeah. 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 Especially yeah. the more rural parts of the area. Right. Yeah. 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 So we're happy to be in community in any way, um, especially going to the outskirts. Any way so we can mm -hmm. celebrate, um, mm -hmm. we're happy to do. Yeah. But do, you don't have, have you got any physical presence in eastern Franklin County in the Rich Rodinesburg area or? Um, well, we do go out there. Yes, I mean, I'm we don't sure have an office out. or anything right. like that, but um, sure I think, you know, we, we have good, strong connections and relationships with the Notches, so yeah. that's, an, that's a spot where, you know, we can go. Well, it we sounds like with Notches have been, yeah. a, have yeah. been a very big oh, success yeah. story. Mm -hmm. I've got a very, yeah. one of my best friends is uh, mm -hmm. on the board of directors, mm -hmm. but yeah. the stuff he mentions to me, just see, yeah. no, it sounds like they've done a tremendous oh, yeah. job. And they yeah. have, and that's, that's a place where people go. They go yeah. for health care, and that's, that's a place that, you know, um, you know, they may call and say, I have somebody in my office right now that, yeah. you know, is talking um, about possibly needing your services so we can connect wow. um, in, in a moment. Um, and we do, can go out there. We've had support groups out there, yeah. so we, yeah. uh, weekly support yeah. groups um, depending on, on the need. And um, anything we can do, um, you know, especially to do outreach in, in the out county areas. Yeah. Yep. Turning Point lets us use their yes, space, too, when we're there. Well. Oh, yeah. And the library is really great yeah, in Richford. Yeah, the library. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Lovely right. library in Richford. And yeah, we fine do, library. Yeah, we do a, a support group with Turning Point um, called Parents in Recovery. Mm -hmm. So we do that weekly, too. Yeah. Um, yeah. Our advocate, Sadie, helps facilitate that group, yeah. which a lot of folks from Richford attend. Yeah. Oh, we have sounds other like support groups too. Sounds mm -hmm. like you have a good uh, rapport, whatever cooperation with mm -hmm. other agencies around here. Oh yeah, yes. We can't yeah. do this work in isolation yeah, or by sure. ourselves. I mean, we, you know, this is a community issue, yeah. so it needs a community response. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So fun funding, different funding sources, but that's always. Mm -hmm. I know you're after yeah. uh, certainly you know, throwing a few bucks in. I think over the years, but funding always always an issue you could always use always. obviously <laughs> more funding yeah we can always use more funding um you know we probably have about you know 25 to 30 different funding sources really? at any given time i wow. mean we have 
We do get funding through um, Crime Victim Services, Vermont Center for Crime Victim Services. Huh. Some of it's state funding, some of it's federal. Yeah. Um, but you know, it's it's not enough. I mean, as our services grow and the need to recruit um, staff, you know, we have yeah. to have you know um, good salaries, you know, to do that. Sure. Um, Ideally, so you'd like more more staff. You could use more staff. I'm, yeah. I'm sure. Yeah, absolutely. We could use more staff, yeah. and you know, but this, you know, our state funding and federal funding is level funded. We don't, yeah. you know, don't see increases, and yeah. um, you know, um, so that makes it difficult. So we're constantly having to do that. We have to do, you know, more fundraising. We have to do come to our local community, you know, because um, you know. Uh, you know, we foundations, uh, all sorts of different you know options out there that you yeah. know, we uh, seek. I mean, some small like we got a you know small grant to do some work in at, uh, at the shelter in the backyard to turn the backyard yeah. into really? you know more. You know, we huh. got a new swing set and we got um, huh. outdoor furniture so people could sit out there and, huh. and things like that. So little things like that um, that we're constantly looking at. You know, that that can make our uh, program um, you know more comfortable. Yeah. yeah, we have Is a little library at the office, so yeah. a lot of folks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, the bookmobile is going to help us with yeah, that too. Right. Um, yeah, so yeah, folks really like to be able to come and get resources about yes, what they're they experiencing yeah. and just stories about people's experience. A lot of our library has a lot of different intersections of domestic and sexual violence, and um, also books about like ending domestic and sexual violence. Mm -hmm. So yeah. we think it's a great resource too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Down to about now three three minutes or so. Oh, Any yeah, okay. you folks have covered a lot of ground. I really appreciate your being here. Oh yeah, thank In you. In a couple minutes, anything we haven't talked about, you want to mention anything? Oh, I just wanted to mention that yeah. our hotline is twenty four hours. It doesn't have to L be an literally emergency. twenty four hours. Yeah, yeah. Every, hours. every day. It's yeah. never down. It's, it's never, never down. down. It doesn't have to be an emergency, and there's no identifying information That's needed. Right. You yeah. can always just call and ask a question. And folks are welcome at any time. They don't have to feel like it's too late. If they just can't sleep and they want to talk, process, um, they're yeah. welcome to. They want to talk about a loved one, family member, yeah. someone else experiencing, and how they can help support. Right. Um, and also community members or community partners. If they're working with someone professionally and they want to collaborate, they're welcome to call the hotline any time. Yeah. yeah, we get lots of calls from, from others, like family members or friends oh, or you know our community partners on behalf of someone else. So. Um, we encourage people to call anytime. Um, and that and that number is anytime. is that right in front of me here? Yeah, or? it's, it's eight zero two. Yeah. Five two four six five seven five. It is right in front of me. Yeah. <laughs> so, and you so. don't even need to use your real name if you no. don't want to. Yeah. We have a lot like, of anonymous anonymous. How many? Do, I'm sure there's nothing nothing resembling a typical day. Typically, <laughs> how many? How many on average? How many calls? You get some calls every day or a bunch oh, of yeah. always, get a call. always yeah. uh, you know yeah. yes always um i you know yeah some days are you know oh wow it seems a, bit, a little bit you know quieter today yeah. and then the next day we could get crazy. slammed oh so busy so, some days. Um, yeah. yeah it just depends and we but, you know we don't know certain times of year ten, tend to really. be busier than others but and what and what what time what times of year tend um, to be busier you know it's like i hear about mid holidays mid summer or? um yeah. you know july you know june july august yeah um Usually, you know, in the past, holidays get a little quieter. Yeah. Huh. You know, oh, right. um, but last holiday <laughs> season was really? crazy. Really? So I say that, and then you know, I know I'm proven wrong the next year. But yeah. um, usually, survivors are hosting; like yeah. they don't have time to access services because they're holding up like a family event. Right. Right. Yeah. right. Or they don't. You know, they yeah. don't want to leave over the holidays. You yeah. know, and be in a shelter or what, what, yeah. what have you. But, um, but yeah, I think we're just seeing. Um, you know, such varied kinds of situations and, and um, you know, people needing assistance. So it's, yeah. so, you know, is, is there, a, you know, a time during the year that's different? You know, I say that and then the next yeah. year it changes. Know, so so it, it's really difficult to say, but. Wow. Literally yeah. down to one, I'm oh, sorry, go down to oh. one minute, but whatever you want uh, to throw I in. I just say, you don't have to call for us either to, uh, to come into our drop-in space on 23 Catherine Street from yeah. 8.30 to 4.30. Yes. You can okay. just walk in to meet with an okay. advocate, yeah. so. Just yes. walk in. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. wow. Yes. And Chris, I got to think you got to be feeling pretty, pretty good. It sounds like a pretty impressive legacy <laughs> after almost uh, three decades with us. Yes. Well, um, it's been it's been uh, my life's work, um, wow. but um, I'm really happy that um, Shannon's taking the lead. Um, she's a great advocate, and uh, you know she'll be a great director. So it's in good hands for sure. Uh, sounds like you have a good, a worthy yeah. successor. Yeah, and the staff is great. You know, we so many caring people. 
Right. On that note, thank you very much to thank Chris you. Lukens, the uh, former longtime director of Voices Against Violence, Lori's House, and Shannon McMahon, who's now the director. Thanks. You covered a lot of ground, folks. Great yeah. job. Well, thank thank you. you very much. Thank you. And thanks always to my producer, Alan Cunningham. I'm Richard Coverthway. We appreciate you watching us here on Northwest Access TV. See you next time. Thank you.